Hello once again, it's Tubal Kane, your YouTube shop teacher, and today's video is entitled Making Handles for a 2-inch Die Stock. You may have watched one of my videos some time ago where I bought piles and piles of plunder, and this die stock was included, and it takes 2-inch dies, a little bit larger than uh, the, the common size that I use is 1.5 inch, but also 1 inch, but this, you can see this is quite a bit bigger, and it is chinesium. It's kind of nicely made though. It's zinc, it's not aluminum, and it's uh, been painted hammer tone. Got some set screws. So what I'm going to do is fabricate two handles, something like this. I'm not sure just yet how I'm going to do it, but uh, let's go over to the workbench and get started. In review now, most of the common what I call button dies are one inchers and most are round but you're going to run into some that are hexagon and then the next most popular size and the size I like the most is the one and a half inch dies like this and I have a, a whole slew of these uh, even more than what you see right here and then of course they will be held in a die stock or a die holder or a die wrench of the appropriate size this being again a one inch and here's a one and a half inches incher. Now why am I showing you that? Because I, I need inspiration here myself in trying to decide what kind of handles I'm going to make and you can see that a lot of them are knurled matter of fact most of them but here's one that is not knurled now if you have too rough of a knurl it's kind of hard on the hands if you're doing a lot of threading so how will I approach this? Well, the first thing I did was to go down to Ace Hardware with this in hand to identify the thread. You can see that there's a counter bore here, and the thread is quite a ways in there. All the way up to this black line, in fact, is a drilled hole. And then the other black line there is the counter bore. Well, I, I had no decent way of measuring that. I do have metric taps, but a tap is not all that good of a way to uh, determine a size because it may want to c cut in there and damage the threads. So anyway, I took this down to Ace Hardware and I went through their selection of bolts until I found the right size and it's a 12 millimeter which is you know pretty close to a half inch and the pitch is 1.75 millimeter. So I had determined the size and then I did find in my selection uh, of course a tap that size in case I need it and the die, it's a hexagon die and it's not a high speed steel one but it's going to have to do for the purposes of this project. So initially I thought I'll just take some round stock perhaps 5 eighths or 3 quarter and I'll knurl it. Well looking through my selection of knurlers this is the larger one and the kind that I like but you can see that the hole size is restricted here and that would be the very longest knurl that I could make and that's not long enough so I decided well, I'm not going to knurl it I can make it just plain round like the samples I show you but I thought no you know what I'm going to do I'm going to make it out of hexagon stock and this would be a nice size here this is 5 8 but looking through all of my material and I have enormous quantities of it I don't have any long pieces of hexagon. I didn't want to take the time to order any, so I thought, well, you know, I'll make my own hexagon, and that'll be a good portion of the video, because I don't think I've ever done a video on how to make a hexagon. You know, I don't know how to do Confusion 360, so I did make a little sketch, preliminary sketch anyway, with most of the dimensions. And uh, I'm not going to fool you here. I went ahead and made my prototype. So there, I'm halfway done. But that is what the handle is going to look like. I'm starting with three quarter inch round like I just showed you there. I will turn it here to do two diameters. That's the 12 millimeter. And then this is the counter bore size. And then I put the hex on the Bridgeport mill using a uh, collet block. And finally, this is a taper. Now, that may not even look like a taper. And in fact, it's only a one degree taper, or should I say two degree included angle. I probably should not have wasted my time on that because that was a lot of effort. And it probably would have been fine if it was just straight because in fact, it almost looks like it is straight. But that's the way the taper turned out in order to get uh, a taper 
within uh, this length that would be this diameter one end and this diameter on the other end. So that uh, that's how it came out to be a one degree taper and then cut off and crowned or beveled or chamfer there just a little bit for appearance and it has a good feel to it and fits right in here and ultimately I'll probably hold it in with Loctite but that's what it'll look like times two and this is what about seven inches uh, six and a half inches long I will start by chucking up the three-quarter inch cold roll 1018 I believe this is 1018 which doesn't machine all that well by the way but uh, I'll turn the two diameters here first and then uh, thread it with the die on the lathe and you know watch the order of operations again and I will speed up most of the footage to get through this fairly fast the first thing that I will do is to face it off Be sure and wear your safety glasses. The counter bore size is 550 thousandths, so the first thing I will do is to turn an inch and a quarter long to 550 thousandths, and note that I have the carriage stop set for that. And there I am within a couple thousandths, close enough. I've reset the carriage stop for three quarters of an inch length, and I'm going to turn it down to 12 millimeter, which happens to be 0.472, but I really want it a little bit underneath that, smaller than that, so the die will start easier. Four seventy-three, so I'll take about five more thousandths off camera, and I'll be to size. Normally, when I power thread on the lathe using a die, I use one of these die holders in the tailstock in a Jacob's chuck. That's the size for one inch, and there's my one and a half incher. But in looking through all of my things, believe it or not, I do not have one like this that is hexagon. And I don't know, even know if they sell one for that matter. So I thought, well, I'll just go ahead and thread it using a die stock and you know, forcing it in with a tail stock. But I really don't like that method at all. So what I decided to do here is to take a, this is a one inch SK socket. And I'm going to hold the die in there like that. And, well, how am I going to hold it in the tail stock then? I had this from another job. That's simply a one half inch drive extension that's been cut off. And the, since this is hardened and very slick and chrome plated, there's a tendency for it to want to slip, so I'll really have to tighten it down. But I think this will do the job. Matter of fact, I know it will. Okay, let's see how this is going to work. slow speed back gears. And now back it out. Looks pretty good. I had chamfered the end of that in case you didn't notice. Now I'm going to put it back in and, and reverse it 
so that it will thread a little closer to the shoulder. I won't show that. And let's see if it fits. Pretty good. I have determined from my sketch and the prototype handle that I want the hexagon to be cut between this mark and this mark. So I just lay that out and I want the hex to be a little longer than what I need because it'll be trimmed on this end and then the taper will come into it on this end. Now I have already mounted it and tightened down the three-quarter collet that is held in the hexagon collet block. Now most of you have one of these or at least you have a square one so you have an idea of what they are so for indexing and producing this uh, hexagon all I'm going to do is mill one side rotate it mill the other and uh, times six is that six times six and I'll have a hexagon and how deep should I go? I'm going to go 40 thousandths deep and that was produced or determined by well it could be determined by trig. I, I couldn't find it in a table so I just did a sample but I like to leave just a little bit of the round stock so there's a bit of a radius there so it's not sharp in the corners like this is sharp in the corners so that gives me that uh, soft feeling and you can see it's still black there that could be taken off with with emery cloth. Now this is the finish that I'm getting. It's not great. You can see the tool marks but it can be draw filed or polished and I did one side. Let's see. Yeah this one is partially cleaned up. It's kind of laborious. I don't know if I'll do that but most of the tool marks are out and I hope to be using a better cutter. I'm going to use a, a, a carbide cutter. So let's go on over to the mill. Now take a close look at the setup here. I've got the collet block in the vise and it's up against the stop and each time I rotate it I'll bring it up against the stop. Not that that length is all that critical but I put a three quarter inch carbide cutter in there which is good and sharp and there's quite a bit of material extended out here so you know we're going to have vibration and so on so it needs to be supported and you're thinking well that's why you put the center hole in. Well not really but it'd be nice if there was a tailstock but I do not have one so I'm just using this big heavy vise palmgren and I'm going to tighten it not on the thread but on uh, the unthreaded portion and that's just going to give it the rigidity that it needs. I don't believe I even need to, to put a clamp on this because this is this is heavy and that'll take up the vibration. Now I've already touched off, that is, turned the machine on, brought the cutter into uh, the work, so I just scratched it, then backed it off, and raised the table 40 thousandths, which I had told you is the depth of the hexagon. So let's take that first cut, and I'm going to start on that black line and finish on that. And I'm going to zero out the digital readout and always start there at the same spot and then I'll, I'll make a note mentally of where I finished also from the DRO so that I'm pretty well consistent. And then I loosen up both vices and can rotate the work one sixth of a turn and bring it up against the stop. And I'm ready for the next cut. And this is side six.
And now it can be taken out. There it is. I'm sure you've noticed by now that I haven't cut it off of the main piece yet. Always a handle, always something to hang on to. And then the last thing to do is to chop it off. Alright, now I'm ready for the taper, which is really the last operation. And I've got it marked there, just with a magic marker, you know, it's just, it isn't that critical. And then that'll be the, the overall length cut off uh, eventually. So I'm going to put it in the atlas lathe in a three-jaw chuck, hold it by the round. I could hold it by the hex, but how true is the hex compared to this? So I'm going to hold it by this, and then I'm going to support it in a center. And it's a dead center, it's not even a hardened one, but it'll do. because I Well, I'll show you during the setup, but that's why there's a center hole in there. And I've already got the machine set up for taper turning with the compound method and the compound is turned or is set at one degree for this angle. Before you start any job make sure that you have all the tools, cutting tools or lathes or whatever with the capacity to do the job that uh, you intend to do such that at the last minute you don't run into some obstacle that cannot be overcome. For instance this is three quarter stock which I know will fit in the spindle of the atlas lathe. Much larger than that, it wouldn't. But this is long enough such that it's extending back into the spindle. But it could have been cut off for this as well. But, you know, there's a lot of material sticking out here, so that's why I'm going to support it. And I did put a little of the CMD on that center. I have a lot of quill sticking out. And that's why I didn't use a regular center. This gives me extra length here because there's almost always interference with the tailstock when you're cutting a shallow taper or a slight taper. In other words, it just barely clears right here. And I had planned for all that and made the setup. <coughs> the setup. So, and I have a little uh, round nose tool in the tool holder. When taper turning by this method, of course, you always need to lock your carriage. And the length of this taper is just a little bit longer than the maximum reach or travel of the compound. So I will cut it almost all the way and then I'll have to move the entire carriage in and reset a little bit and try to blend it in so you can't see where those two different cuts actually uh, coincided. And now I'm taking the very final pass. Looking good. Now perhaps a little filing before I take it out of the machine. This one is pretty well polished up and ready to use. This one can use a little more attention as far as uh, some of the tool marks are concerned, which I will do off camera. But there we are, and the overall length is about 
12 plus 6 is about 18 inches long, so it'll be plenty of leverage. It has a good feel to it. Won't tear your hands up. So now I'm all ready to thread something that's 3 quarter 27. Looks pretty good. Proportion is fine. Hope you enjoyed all the different operations and steps that I, I, I took in making these handles and maybe can apply them towards some of the jobs that you do in your shop. Hope you enjoyed the video. This is Tubal Kane saying so long for now.